Tonight, Rishi Sunak insists his party is united, but for how long? I've spent the day speaking to Conservative MPs, and what's clear is that the PM is losing control. The question now is, how long can it go on for? Ofcom decides against punishing the TV channel GB News, despite saying it breached the rules five times. I'll be joined live by a former Ofcom content partner who says the regulator's approach is diluting trust in the media. And the government's Rwanda bill is back in the Commons tonight for a series of votes. Is Sunak's target of getting the first flights to take off in the spring still on track, or could it be derailed again? I'll speak to one senior Tory MP who said he could rebel against his party tonight, Sir Robert Buckland, and I'll speak to the Shadow Immigration Minister, Stephen Kinnock, about Labour's new plans to tackle boat crossings. And Westminster got a surprise visit this afternoon from none other than former US President Barack Obama. We'll look back at some of his previous trips to the UK. All that and more with Sean Berry and Liam Fox, who will be with me for the next hour. It's Monday. I'm Beth Rigby, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Good evening. While the economy is turning the corner, the government's getting closer to sending flights off to Rwanda, and this is the year where Britain apparently could bounce back. That was what Rishi Sunak had to say today on a visit to Warwickshire as he tries to reboot his stuttering premiership again. The problem he's got, the country isn't listening and his party isn't either. As the PM tries to get back on with the job, back in Westminster, his MPs are consumed by the ongoing Tory psychodrama around Rishi Sunak's leadership. One former cabinet to minister told me today the PM was at a tipping point, having lost command and control of his party. Another, who wants to change leader, told me the situation was unsustainable, while a supportive Tory grandee said he thinks the PM will hang on, but there are painful weeks ahead. If you find it all a bit confusing, it's because it is. The parties become ungovernable, split into factions and thrashing around as MPs stare down the barrel of a potential election wipeout, walk into the gunfire or try to change general. Most MPs would probably rather stick, not twist, but that doesn't mean the Prime Minister won't face a confidence vote in the coming months if 50-plus MPs decide they want him gone. Rebels admit they are some way off that threshold, but what everyone can agree on is that the local elections on May the 2nd are fast turning into a critical test for an embattled Prime Minister, with more political drama on the cards. Well, we'll hear from our Deputy Political Editor Sam Coates in a moment, but first, let's hear that rally cry from the Prime Minister for unity within his party during a visit to Warwickshire earlier today. All Conservatives are united in wanting to deliver a brighter future for our country, and that's why we're cutting people's taxes, £900 for a typical person in work. We're increasing the state pension by £900 in just a few weeks. We're in the middle of one of the biggest expansions of free childcare that our country's seen. We're getting the number of boats down by a third last year, tackling illegal migration, and today announcing new numbers of apprenticeships, supporting small businesses, these are all the things that matter to people, and we are absolutely united in delivering for the country on these important matters. Well, there's the Prime Minister, and now I am joined by none other than Sam Coates. Sam, I imagine you've been over in Westminster today talking to MPs, as have I. Uh, what are you hearing? So I've been over in the lobbies for about six hours. Mm. <sighs> what you're getting today is despair, uncertainty, a lack of a plan, mm. um, a kind of resignation about the political situation of the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister. Mm. But last week, there was something especially toxic in the air. There was something really febrile. There was a mood around for something quite radical. 
And then Rishi Sunak made clear that the local elections were just going to be the only elections to be held on May the 2nd. And um, although we've had all these talk over the weekend of, you know, plots involving Penny Morden, which I think mostly were hostile briefings done mm. to her rather than things that anybody with her best interests were putting out there, it doesn't feel today like having had the early election taken off the table, anybody that I talked to in the Tory party over the last few hours particularly knows what to do other than it is incredibly mm. bad. Mm. So mm. there are headless chickens, there are people despairing, but, mm. but is there a plan? Is there and a plot? I mean, it's not clear. Yeah, and that this sort of idea about it being confusing because you speak to different people and everyone will agree it's awful, but they're not sure what to do next. Uh, a lot of people are talking about May the 2nd now as a real danger point for the Prime Minister. Is that what you've picked up as well today? Oh, absolutely. Nobody thinks it's going to get any better. And, and we had a really weird spectacle. Yesterday, Downing Street issued a 2,600-word press release about a speech mm. to be given by the Prime Minister this morning about economic policy, his first since the budget. Rishi Sunak stood up and it lasted six minutes, 40 seconds, most of it a repeat of things he'd said before. Downing Street really struggles to land messages. Mm. Downing Street and Rishi Sunak struggle to change the weather. And that's why if things don't improve and things get worse and we get to those local elections on May the 2nd and they are as bad as MPs expect, yes, there'll be more of this, but to what end? Nobody seems sure, nobody seems to know where to go. There were lots of people coming out wanting even today it to be May, even though the Prime Minister's ruled it out. Mm. Some of them just want the pain to end. And it's going to be... Uh really unclear and I wonder whether you could get to a confidence vote by accident rather than design because of the febrile nature of the party. I mean, what's clear is when we were, you know, do it covering Boris Johnson, there was organisation. This is just, this is just party chaos, isn't it? it that's right. Mm. The question is, can it really stretch on to mm. October or November? That's where when you look at people in the eyes, they can't quite say yes. The mm. trigger for a confidence vote is, is, is low. It's, it's much less than half the party. Mm. You can see that happening, mm. but to what end? People aren't sure. It's going to keep us busy, that's for sure. It's going to keep us in work, Sam. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah. for joining us on the Politics Hub. Um, Sam Coates there. Well, look, a little earlier I spoke to former Justice Secretary Robert Buckland. Robert Buckland, thanks for joining us on Politics Hub. Now, I want to talk to you all about the Rwanda bill, yeah. but before we get to that, how much trouble is Rishi Sunak in? Well, look, it's a challenging time to be Prime Minister. I think anybody in office is facing huge challenges at home and abroad. The economy, security, health service, all these issues are pressing upon us, largely as a result of the uh, impact of COVID and all the mm. problems that we've experienced. So this is a tough job. But it's not made any easier by gossip and rumour-mongering. I think that all needs to end. Mm. Uh, I don't think as many people involved in that. The majority of MPs I speak to spend their weekends, like I did, uh. knocking doors Mm. talking to residents and dealing with the issues that matter to the public rather than worrying about the Westminster uh, uh, spin machine. OK, so the Westminster spin machine, but when I talk to all of your colleagues, I'm sorry to say, but everyone I talk to is... Everyone is talking about the Tory psychodrama at the moment and the predicament of the Prime Minister. Has he lost command of the party? How dangerous is the situation for him? Could he face a confidence vote? Look, I, I don't believe so, Beth. I think this is a very small uh, issue. I think there might be one or two people expressing concerns. We know some of them publicly. But the vast majority of Tory MPs know that this is an election year. And in election years, you need to get behind the lead and get mm. on with the job of talking about the economy, talking not... about the issues that matter but to the, the public. But the problem is they're not getting behind the leader. And even if it is a small... A uh, group of people, it's very loud what they're doing and it's very destabilising, right? Well, look, sometimes I think there's the echo chamber of modern politics where one voice becomes magnified by repetition or retweeting whatever you like. I don't think that's representative of the vast majority of colleagues either here in Westminster mm. or indeed councillors and friends right across the party. We've got an election to fight. Mm. We've got the future of our country at stake. Nothing mm. could be more important. And the way we win the election is by focusing on what matters to the voters, not what matters to politicians here at Westminster. This is about the future of our country. The Prime Minister's focusing on that with a speech on the economy today. He's right to prioritise the economy. You, that's what will decide the election. You, 
that's what we need to be talking about. Has he lost authority <coughs> in the party, though? I mean, a lot of people are saying he should have sacked Tom Tugendhat and Anne-Marie Trevelyan uh, for making an intervention on defence spending, Andrew Bowie uh, for making an intervention on uh, the decision to tax oil and gas. Like, he has... Uh, lost cabinet collective responsibility, some people are saying, an authority mm. within the party. I well, mean, he well, is on shaky ground, isn't well, he? Well, I mean, it doesn't look like collective responsibility has been lost. I mean, one or two ministers speaking out of turn can be dealt with by the chief whip, I am sure. Uh, collective responsibility matters. I see it being enforced in this government. The Prime Minister has had notable successes. Mm. He's making progress on the economy, Beth. Mm. And we see uh, health waiting lists coming down. We're seeing progress on reducing the small boats. One more thing about it is I've spoken to a lot of your colleagues today. I'm now spending my life ringing round, testing uh, the temperature within the Conservative Party. Uh, lots of disagreement about how dangerous the situation Sunak is in. Some people are more along your lines. Some people think he's in real trouble. What everyone does seem to agree on is that the local elections is a danger point for him. Well, look... Every local election cycle is always a tough moment or it's a moment of success for leaderships. But local elections are decided on myriads of different issues. People who voted local elections tend to be very politically engaged. Mm. They're the ones who come out regularly. Um, I, whilst they're very important, and of course, as usual, I'll be fighting and supporting mm. my candidates in Swindon, as I've done for nearly 20 years. I think that ultimately how people vote at a local election isn't necessarily what happens mm. at a general election. What we should be remembering is that by focusing on the priorities of the people, which is the economy, which is health, which is sorting out migration, then we will earn our right to win. Let's park that for a moment because one thing that might help him is getting these flights mm. off to Rwanda. How critical is that for the Prime Minister's future and the future for the Conservative Party to get these flights away? Well, I think, most importantly, what is in the interests of the country? And I think doing something innovative on using a third country, working with a third country to help deal with what is an international problem is something I think we should welcome. In fact, at no time have the courts said that this was unlawful and other European countries are looking at similar models. This is innovative, groundbreaking stuff, and it's going to be difficult, which is why we've got to make sure that in the legislation we pass, we don't create yet more hurdles for the courts to have to examine and potentially mm. mark the government down on. Mm. And that's why I think the detail of today's vote is important. I want to make sure that Rwanda does what it's agreed to do in the treaty, mm. uh, to bring in all these procedures to make it absolutely watertight, mm. and we can show the world mm. that working with another country, we can help manage what is a you, really difficult problem. The the obvious question from that, though, Robert, is that in making sure that all of the treaty has been implemented could slow down uh, the timing with which those flights get away, which would politically be quite damaging for the Prime Minister. Do you acknowledge that? Well, look, I think it's clearly in everybody's interest, most notably the national interest, for these flights to happen. And I think for Keir Starmer mm. to say that he'd scrap the scheme even if it worked is a rather extreme position. And I don't think one that stands to, uh, up to close scrutiny. I think clearly we'd like to get those flights sooner rather than later. But my worry is that if we, uh, you know, rush the fence here and pass legislation mm. that doesn't stand up to scrutiny, we're only going you're, to delay it further. You're, but these amendments are all going to be overturned anyway, aren't they? The government aren't listening to what you want. Uh, frankly, probably not. Uh, I think they'd be wise to, but uh, it may well be that the Lords will come back with further refinements that could work mm. in a better way. But you're not um, going to torpedo the bill. You wouldn't vote against it because they won't accept your amendments. Well, look, I, 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 the, the bill it has been through both houses now. The, these, this is detail on the amendment part of the bill. There are issues that I have with some of the uh, Lords' amendments. There are other ones that I agree with. Um, I, I have to accept that I, I vote for myself and I, I use my conscience as, a, as an individual member ah, of Parliament. So you might abstain or vote against? Well, I've, I've said that uh, there are some uh, Lords' amendments that I think are, have merit. Mm. Uh, and that's why I've been listening hard in the debate today and I'll go mm. back and listen more. Uh, I want to see this bill be as legally watertight mm. as possible. What we mustn't do is create a situation where we have yet more wrangling in the courts, Robert, which serves nobody any you, good. You're part of the One Nation group of Conservatives. Lots of your colleagues were also uncomfortable about um, some aspects of this legislation. Are there others that might 
consider whether to support it? Well, look, I, I, I'm sure that individuals and colleagues and friends are looking, uh, as I do, at the detail of the bill, and there may well be other people who agree with me. Uh, there might be a number who choose okay. to abstain. Uh, but, look, I think ultimately... We all want this to work, but it's got to work in a way that is legally is your, sound. Is your message to the government, just accept some of our amendments, please, thank you, and we'll back you, but otherwise maybe not? Well, yeah, yes, I think, I think the whole mm. process of legislative scrutiny mm. is designed to improve legislation, and that's why it, uh, I think, is wise sometimes to and heed those warnings. And how many people do you think might be in your camp? I don't know, Beth. I'm not uh, in the business of whipping votes or doing that sort of machination. I uh, come to this using my own individual guess, judgment in the Burkean tradition of representing I democracy. I guess the point is it's very important for the Prime Minister to come through this week with that legislation going to royal assent. It's really critical for him. You, what you're saying is accept some of the amendments or you might not be guaranteed to have the support of... A chunk of your MPs. Well, I'm not uh, sitting here and holding out on behalf of other colleagues. I think that would be wrong. Uh, I think people in the party have known my views about this mm. consistently. Okay. I spoke at all stages, and I'm going to be consistent to what I think is the best balance it'd be pretty, uh, here. It'd be pretty bad if he can't get the bill passed. I mean, then he's really in, he's like oh, in I the love, kill zone, isn't uh, he? I think the bill passes. Uh, and I think that, uh, we, you know, what we need to do here is elevate all of this above the soap opera of whether the Prime Minister's up or down or in or out. That's not actually what he is interested in. It's not what the country's interested in. Let's remember who matters here. It's millions of people out there whose lives and the future of mm. our country depend on the, what, the choices well, we make this year. And that's why we need to focus relentlessly on what they want. And, Robert, just finally on this, you know, the idea is now politically people talk about if you can just get a plane away, a win is a win, even if it's just dozens of people, not huge numbers. How important is it for the Prime Minister? I know you don't, you know, you said it's about Bigush, but it is also about his survival and, and also delivering what he's promised to the public. Mm -hmm. How important is it for him to get a plane away? And do you think it can happen before a general election if you base it on a general election happening in the second yeah. half of the year? I think it's important and I think it's eminently uh, achievable to get a plane off by the election. But this is not the only issue upon which he should be judged. He should be judged on the fight against inflation, mm. on increased wages, on growing the economy, mm. on getting the big issues right. And he's making the right calls and he's showing maturity, hard work and an example, I think, that uh, we can follow. And your colleagues that are rabble roused at the moment. Have you spoken to any of them directly? Have you... I mean, what's... Is it bad... Is it ill-tempered within I, the party I, at the moment? I am not having any of those conversations with colleagues, uh, and I don't think colleagues are having many I of mean, those conversations. I mean, remonstration with them, telling them to... I, Shut up. I, look, people know my view, and I express it fairly trenchantly on uh, local and national media. Uh, colleagues, I think, uh, you know, who've been around the cycle as I have will know that in an election year, it's now time to get together, focus relentlessly on the public okay. and forget about the mass I'm going to I'm going to end this now, <laughs> but just a hundred... Are you a hundred percent sure that Rishi Sunak will lead the Conservatives into the next general election? Absolutely. You're absolutely sure of that? Well, th there's no question, of course. Course. OK. Robert Butlin, thank you so much for joining us on Politics Hub. Thank it's you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Buckland there, pretty sure that Rishi Sunak will lead the Conservatives into the next general election, despite all the noise of late. Well, let's bring our duo for tonight, former co-leader of the Green Party, Sean Berry, and former Defence Secretary, Dr Liam Fox. Liam, if I can start with you, what's your message to restive MPs tonight, and how much trouble is the Prime Minister in? I don't think the Prime Minister is in a lot of trouble. I think you've got a small number of irreconcilable MPs who didn't want him to be the leader and have not had the decency to accept the democratic result. They're an echo chamber uh, for one another. They seek out the media, they brief all the time. I've not had any discussions with them because I don't think I'm one of the people they would come and talk to. Um, and they, they need to remember that they've been elected for the good of the country, for the good of the constituents, not for their own egos. And, and they really need to be quiet and get on with business. One of your 
colleagues, a very, very senior Conservative MP said to me uh, today that he thought there were about 80% of the party behind the Prime Minister and 20% against the Prime Minister. But the point is that Rishi Sunak needs to harness the 80% because at the moment he is in freefall. Do you agree with that as, a, as the numbers? What I, what I, I, it's difficult to say because you, you've got these small factions who keep on wanting to talk to the media all the time. I would say that what we need is a clear narrative. Um, and I would say it has to be around the economy. We, mm. we began with a letter from the Labour Chief Secretary who said there's no money. David Cameron and George Osborne got the deficit down from 11% to 1.8%. Without that, Boris Johnson wouldn't have had £400 billion for the pandemic. Rishi Sunak wouldn't have been able to save 11.7 million jobs in the furlough. And had we not done that, we wouldn't have been growing faster than France and Germany since the pandemic. And, and Jeremy wouldn't have had... 70 billion to hand out for aid for people uh, after the Ukraine hike in energy prices. And they need to have a narrative that sets out across the period mm. that tough decisions were taken. And that's why we're seeing, as the Prime Minister said today, the economy I turning mean, around. And I, I understand why Labour want an early election. They're afraid of the public seeing well, an improvement of the economy over the summer. Well, well also, um, why would the Conservative Sean want? an election when you're still 20 plus points behind in the polls and the party is involved in quite an open civil war. And as Liam says, it might be a small minority, but my goodness, they are loud. What, what's your perspective about this? Do you think we should have an early election? I think the whole country needs an early election. If things were as rosy as, as Liam was just saying, then, then the Prime Minister ought to be calling an election now. But I think people are not feeling the, the improvement in living standards, people are not feeling the improvement in their day-to-day -day lives that the Prime Minister has been trying to spin today. He does desperately need to do something right and then he might call an election. But at the moment, people are just finding this, this infighting to be, to be absolutely tedious. We've seen it so many times and we want to go out there and vote for a, a Prime Minister. And we haven't been able to. The Conservative Party's just been chopping and changing them for us for, for several years now. And it's getting to be way too much. We need to go to the polls. People are feeling that need right around the country. Liam, we, need your... to, we need a new government. Okay. We need a different so, government. From your point of view, though, you think an election in October, November give the time for, 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 for economic upturn if that's what happens. Is that where you're at? Yes, I think we're going to see that. I mean, we know inflation's falling. We know it will fall further. We know that we'll then see rates coming, coming down. We know that people will start to feel better. They've had two tax cuts that they'll start to notice. And also, it will give us a chance if my colleagues would shut up for 10 minutes, to be able to show that it's not a, a referendum on the government, it's a choice mm. between a Conservative government and a Labour government. Mm. And this Labour Party doesn't have any clear alternatives on, on Rwanda. It doesn't have any clear alternatives on the economy. This is the most... Um, That's true. It is, yeah. but it's, it's, it's an opposition. <laughs> it's an opposition okay. gonna... that is almost scared for there to be okay. clear blue water yeah. between the parties. Yeah, we, need, need to... we, we need to see a change, and we need to see some, some, something bolder in Number 10, and that isn't currently Keir Starmer, but, but after an election, potentially, mm. Green MPs can have a good okay. influence on, on at least a well, Labour government. We're going to we're gonna come back and carry on chatting. Um, I like Liam telling his colleagues to shut up there. <laughs> That was quite forceful. Like, what, you're not what, messing what around else, tonight, what are else, you? What else would you around. expect? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you're watching uh, The Politics Hub coming up. Ofcom has put GB News on notice after finding that five programmes presented by Conservative MPs broke impartiality rules. But does the channel care? Or is a ticking off from the regulator good for business? We'll debate. Sleep is so important. It's, it's essential to maintain our physical health, our cognitive function, emotional regulation, mental health. It really is very, very far reaching and the impact is huge. Looking at, at in, on our mental health, the impact on our mental health, we know that when we're sleep deprived, we might feel more irritable, frustrated, maybe a bit more moody. Also our stress and anxiety levels are on the increase. There's a very strong connection between stress and anxiety 
and sleep deprivation in that the more stressed and anxious we are, the more likely that is to affect our sleep. And consequently, the more sleep deprived we are, the more that is potentially going to increase our stress and anxiety levels. Um, and also simply the, the energy to be able to be productive in our day, keep organized in our day, exercise. It's got huge, huge implications. There's so many things that we can do to improve our sleep. So I, I would just pulling out a few of the main tips. I would say, first of all, regulating your wake up time as much as possible. We all have an internal body clock or circadian rhythm that dictates our sleep wake cycle. And if we're waking at very fluctuating times, then that's going to leave us feeling quite groggy and impact on our sleep cycles, almost leave us in a permanent state of, of a feeling of jet lag. So really trying to regulate our wake up time as much as possible. Obviously, that's not always possible, especially people like you guys that are often working shift work as well, but in, in as much as possible. Also, allowing ourselves time, and I talk about permission and giving ourselves permission to have wind down leading up to bedtime. We talk about this for children all the time, the importance of a bedtime routine. But it's really important that we as adults, we have that same wind down time, that we allow ourselves to be able to ease into sleep rather than jumping into sleep because that can really exacerbate sleep problems. Welcome back. Well, five episodes of GB news programmes presented by Tory MPs have been found to have broken broadcasting rules. Ofcom found that two episodes of Jacob Rees-Mogg's State of the Nation programme and three other programmes hosted by politicians, including the government's common sense czar, Esther McVeigh, did not present news with due impartiality because it said politicians were acting as news readers interviewers or reporters. The media watchdog said any repeated breaches of the rules would result in a statutory sanction. Well, it has come out swinging. In a statement, GB News said, we are deeply concerned by the decisions Ofcom has made today. We will raise this directly with the regulator in the strongest possible terms. Ofcom is obliged by law to promote free speech and media plurality and to ensure that alternative voices are heard. Its latest decisions, in some cases a year after the programme aired, contravene those duties. This is a chilling development for all broadcasters, for freedom of speech and for everyone in the United Kingdom. But is GB News well bothered? Or does the channel consider it a feather in a cap to be ticked off? by the regulator. Former editor of Channel 4 News and former chief executive of ITN, who also worked as a regulator at Ofcom, Stuart Purvis, is here. Evening, ben. So nice to see you. Thank you for coming on. Okay. Uh, so, Stuart, Ofcom have acted today. They've mm. put GB News on notice. You've been calling for a while for them to get tougher. You must mm. be pleased with the outcome. Well, I have to say, I think Ofcom is trying to make the best of a bad job. And it's a job it gave itself when it said that politicians could present political programmes. It put one condition, they could not present news programmes, but they could present current affairs programmes. Now, immediately you ask, what's the difference? Well, mm -hmm. if you take this programme we're on now, is it a news programme or a current affairs? I think by Ofcom's mm -hmm. definition, it's probably a current affairs programme which means you could be replaced by a politician. You could have... God the forbid. Absolutely. You could what have... What a terrible idea. <laughs> somebody from the same political side night after night sitting in that chair. Mm. Your guest could be of the same side night after night. Now, I don't think that's what any of us thought impartiality was. Okay. But Ofcom is trying to get out of that hole it's kind of dug itself in by saying, oh, look, there was a bit in that programme where they actually changed over from being current affairs to news. You know, you know for instance, now, if a story were to break now and you had to go live somewhere, they, they deem that that's being a news reader. But, yeah. So when, when, uh, when Jacob Rees-Mogg does it, he says, no, he can't do that because he's a political presenter. Okay, so that... Confusing. Right, so that's the problem. That's the and problem. it's probably uncharted territory because GB News has, unlike other uh, broadcasters yeah. that, uh, that, that carry current affairs and news, have, have yeah. put 
politicians into presenting roles. So it's kind of new territory. And, and, and deliberately so, deliberately trying to challenge the status quo. And they would probably say, look, you could have always done this, but you people, uh, you, you know, you, you never thought of doing it. We thought of doing it. So, you know, was it, were the rules always saying this and have Ofcom's just allowed people to do it? Or have they changed the rules? Ofcom's a bit shifted Well, Stuart, I guess the, the next thing is, if that's the problem or the issue, yeah. do you think anything will actually change? Or do you think that GB News won't adapt its model and that they actually want this fight? Well, I think they will probably do, do both. They will look for a fight uh, and might even go to court over it. At the same time, they will adjust their model. They will not have their presenters, the political presenters, their MPs, doing anything that looks like a, a live development. So if a live story breaks, I suspect they'll say, over to the newsroom. We're not going to mm. say anything. We're not going to comment on it. That's the way they'll get around that, whilst at the same time, night after night, having these, I would say, biased programmes. There's no other way of, of saying what they're doing. And Ofcom not doing anything about it. Now, Ofcom have threatened a statutory sanction. That could include a fine. So there, there is a threat there. They have got more teeth, the regulator? They have, and of course they have banned stations like Russia Today, RT, and Iranian station Press TV. I think they would not want to have to ban a British broadcaster because of multiple infringements of the rules. So the question is now, uh, uh, what's the graduated steps here before they have to consider that ban? I presume if, if Ofco, uh, decides that GB News is still breaking the rules, they will put the fight, they will find them, then they'll find them a higher fine, a higher fine. Quite where that ends, I don't think anybody knows. And, and Stuart, just to go back to the beginning of the conversation where you said the problem is actually this distinction between news yeah. and current affairs, is one outcome that the regulator might have to revisit this and tighten up the rules so it's clearer, be it current affairs or news, about impartiality. I, I, I think so, and I think the general election is, is the time to do that, or in advance the general election. Right. Surely we can't have political programmes going out where politicians speak for 10 minutes to camera at the start of a programme about their view of the day's political events, and then they have people who agree with them, and they, then they have viewers' calls from people who agree with them. How could that happen during a general election? It can't, and Ofcom needs to grasp this nettle now and clarify what's going to happen during a general election. The, the point is, though, that GB News has been pretty successful. I know it's loss making, but obviously, often startups are television. We both know is expensive yeah. to make, but but you know they are they are hitting some market, right? So there's appetite for it for their model. Yeah. The, the question is, why do the British public have greater trust in broadcast news than any other form of news and information? Because of the impartiality rules. If you want, if the government of the day, or if Parliament, more importantly, wants to get rid of impartiality rules, they are perfectly right to do that. What they can't do is have them applied almost right. selectively, which is what's going so on. So, do you think that GB News is <clears throat> polluting the news environment in that sense? Well, I have to say, I think that to allow one station to breach what I think is a common sense interpretation of the rules does actually damage the public's trust in broadcast news. And surely that can't be in anybody's interest. It's certainly in the, in the interests of, of the shareholders of GB News who are losing £40 million a year to get a few more people to watch. And that's why they will enjoy this fight. Yeah, you know, just going back to the GB News statement and, you know, enjoying the fight, they are claiming Ofcom have moved the goalposts because they're saying they've been reprimanded for the perception uh, that something they've broadcast might be... Uh, partial rather than whether it is or not have they if they got a point there they've got a point in the sense that this it's at, at times it feels like the rules are being made up as they go along or as we go along and therefore they have a right to say that's not quite what you said before Ofcom. you seem to be saying something different now so uh, I, I understand why they're saying that and i'm sure their lawyers are, are going to push that point Ofcom absolutely has to help now take a clear and consistent line particularly in a run-up to now. Yeah, I was going to... So, Stuart, we, we are obviously at a, a critical juncture. It's an it's a election year. You've been yeah. quite critical of Ofcom and how it's been run. Yeah. How quickly do you think they need to act on GB News? Do you think they need to clean this up before we get into an election campaign? Well, funnily enough, I see it not so much as a fight against GB News, although I know that's inevitably. I see it as Ofcom sorting out once and for all what are the rules about impartiality. Everyone's a bit confused. Now, GB News here, they're a bit more confused. We need to have it sorted out. If, you know, and GB News has to, I think, accept whatever that solution is. So 
I wish, wish Ofcom would get on with it. It's taken them almost a year to get to this point. I... We can't afford another year before they look at it again. Just, just with Ofcom, I mean, there was yeah. a time when broadcasters lived in fear of Ofcom, terrified of the phone ringing yeah. or an invite for a not very friendly chat. There doesn't seem to be much deference to the regulator now. What's going on? Have Ofcom kind of lost a leadership role here? Well, I remember when Melanie Dawes, Dame Melanie Dawes was on this very programme with Sophie, and Sophie made that point to her. And, and Melanie Dawes said, no, well, we haven't changed the rules, we haven't changed the rules. But of course, in fact, they had changed the interpretation of the rules. Mm. So they haven't entirely been honest about what's going on here. And yes, I think people now don't fear the call from Ofcom the way they did, mm. no. And actually, to be honest, broadcasters didn't used to criticise Ofcom decisions. That's certainly not what's happened today. F final thought, just more broadly. Do you think GB News is good for the media landscape or bad? I have no problem with a TV news channel or current affairs channel which wants to use as its agenda right-wing talking points or, mm. or left-wing talking points. I have no problem with that. What you then have to have is those items covered impartially. Mm, mm. And I guess that goes back to the bigger question you're making about broadcasters being trusted because we yeah. have had uh, an age of impartiality. All right, well, Stuart, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I'm sure we're going to be talking about this uh, a lot more. Um, and I think there's other, there's other cases yeah. that, that, that Ofcom are looking about with GB News. Thank you, Stuart. Wow, uh, that was Stuart Purvis on GB News and Ofcom there. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up. After the break, we'll get reaction from that interview from my guest panel, Sean Berry and Liam Fox.
welcome back. Now, before the break, we heard from Stuart Purvis on the Ofcom ruling on GB News. Well, let's bring in my guests, Sean Berry and Liam Fox. Sean, you first. Do you ever watch GB News or have you been on it? Not if I can avoid it. And I've never knowingly been on GB News. They may have reported some stuff that recorded me, but um, no, I've never accepted an invitation. And, and I never accepted invitations from Russia Today and I never accepted invitations from Islam TV either because I don't really believe that any pro any channel ought to be as biased as that, as, as serving a vested interest the way that GB do, News do you, does. Do you not think that if you got on there and, and, and talked about some of the Green Party's policies and that it might be a way of communicating to perhaps people that wouldn't necessarily automatically look, look at I, the Green I think, Party. I think I would lend them credibility, interested. which they shouldn't have, as uh, a, a, an outlet that is entirely about a biased point of view and vested interest. I think your, your, um, the, your interview just then was completely right. News is a really precious thing. It needs to have some sort of quality standards attached to it. Ofcom need to be maintaining those standards so that people can look at the news and trust that they're getting something that is actually factual, fact-checked, that isn't pushing a particular point of view. That's not what GB News is. Lynn, what, what do you think of GB News? I think disruptors are good in broadcasting. I think it's good to get a different uh, players coming in and I think it's healthy overall. I think if there are rules, they have to be obeyed. Uh, what struck me about you, the debate that you just had was you know, one person's impartiality may not be another's. I mean, I think, for example, your introduction tonight about the Prime Minister was very partial. Um, the question is whether there is then sufficient balance oh, to oh. give alternative views. And I think that many people watching would find it quite difficult to, 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 to be able to define so, adequately what is news and what's current so affairs. You, you think, so you think that kind of GB News in their rebuttal has a point, right, that... That they that the that the uh, Ofcom when they are trying to do current affairs, as long as they have enough balance in the programmes, they should be allowed to have this. They, they, they have, should be allowed to have politicians yeah, I mean, they, doing the shows. Absolutely, as long as if they make it clear if there has to be a dif differentiation between news and current affairs, that yeah. when they move to news, that's what it is. But remember, not not everybody is happy with a sort of liberal le uh, metropolitan bias which many people will feel is in the mainstream news, which is why I think so many people are actually watching and would GB you, News. Would you have, have you been asked to do a show on it and would you ever do that? Oh, Beth, we both know I'm too shy for that. I am, you are definitely not too shy for it. Would you, would you ever do it? No, no I It's not your thing. It's not my thing. Um, what, I, do you, what, what do you think about um, politicians, your colleagues that do? Others choose to do it, but I think that um, I, I prefer politics where you're being asked the questions mm. uh, and you can be interrogated properly. Um, and I, I, I just think that that's a more challenging environment to be in politically and we should welcome that. And Sean? I, I saw the GB News statement today that was kicking back against Ofcom and called itself an alternative voice. And given that it's stuffed with people who are from the ruling party, I don't think that's quite right. I think that's something we should genuinely worry about. If we start having politicians who are already in charge governing the news mm. agenda, we don't, we don't want to go down that road. Well, I am sure that we will be discussing this a lot more, not least because there are some investigations still underway. And also, as we go into a general election, it's going to be interesting to see, presumably, some of your colleagues who are politicians won't be able to present shows in elections, I would imagine. But... I imagine that would be an interesting question uh, for Ofcom to look okay. at. Um, okay. it, we've never had uh, something like GB News in an election yeah. cycle. Okay. So there will be new questions uh, yes. to answer because you've okay. got this new disruptive... All right, I've got, to, I've got to move on. I'm being shouted at in my ear. <laughs> I just find it so interesting keep talking to you. Um, well, a little earlier I spoke to Shadow Immigration Minister Stephen Kinnock about, among other things, the Rwanda Bill and Labour's plans to tackle illegal immigration. Stephen, the Rwanda Bill is coming back to the Commons. It's likely that it will get royal assent at the end of the week. That is a massive win, isn't it, for a Prime Minister that really needs to get those flights off the ground? Well, no, it's not, because the entire scheme is unworkable, unlawful and unaffordable. Uh, a vast amount of money is being spent, £2 million per asylum seeker if you send 300 to Rwanda, which, by the way, is the maximum the Rwandan government has said it can take. And that's never going to act as a deterrent. 1% uh, of the 
number that crossed the channel last year, people who've risked life and limb uh, to get to northern France, they're not going to be deterred on a 1% chance of going to Rwanda. So the whole scheme is a con, it's a gimmick, and rather than chasing headlines, the government should have been listening to Labour and adopting our the pragmatic five-point plan. Stephen, the, the, the government would say that um, Rwanda will scale up the number of failed asylum seekers that it will take. And they would also say that this is one part of a whole raft of measures that the government are implementing in trying to drive down the number of boat crossings. Given that they are now getting the scheme up and running, isn't scrapping it throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Well, just think about the vast amount of money and resource and political capital that has been squandered on this madcap uh, Rwanda scheme. If the government had been uh, using that time and energy and resource uh, on doing the pragmatic things like uh, 1,000 new officials into an immigration enforcement unit, like getting much better cooperation with Europol and uh, other police forces to go after the criminal gangs at source, like surging 2,500 asylum caseworkers to clear the backlog and save the taxpayer £8 million a day on hotels. So uh, politics is about choices and it's about priorities. And the government has got it wrong on Rwanda. Do they you, should have been doing the pragmatic, common sense things instead. Do you really, realistically expect the bill to pass by the end of the week? Well, the government has a 70-odd seat majority in, in the Commons, and in the end, the Commons can overrule Lord's Amendment. Okay. So it will go back to the Lords, it will come back to us. Uh, we are trying to improve the bill, even though that's a difficult job because it's such a ludicrous piece of legislation. But it, at the end of the day, if the government has a 70-odd seat majority, it would be pretty extraordinary if it, they couldn't and, get their flagship and bill a win, through. And a win's a win, isn't it? You, I know you're very critical of the scheme, but if the Prime Minister can get flights physically off the ground, he can at least say to the British people, I said I would get flights off the ground and I have achieved that. That is a result for him. No, the measure of success is will it stop the Tory small boats chaos? Will it have a significant impact in terms of reducing the number of people that are coming across the channel in this way? And the answer to that question is no, it will not, because it won't act as a, as a deterrent, because the Rwandan government can't take uh, a large enough number of people to, can, for it to be credit, a deterrent. So the British where, people are not stupid. Where, At the credit, end of the day, they will judge the Prime Minister on whether or not it reduces the small boat crossings, where, not whether he due. sends a few flights off. Credit where credit is due to the Prime Minister. He said he would stop small boats. That is quite a lofty ambition. But boat crossings are down by a third. Like, they are... The policy... The, the, the package of policies is not just total abject failure, which is how you're trying to present it. Well, two big reasons for that. One is the Albania deal that they did, which has reduced drastically the number of Albanians crossing the channel. Labour supports that policy, and we just wish that they'd done more of those returns deals with other countries where, which are generating large numbers of small boat crosses. And the other point, of course, is the weather. And um, the number of small boat crossings is very dependent on the weather. This year, since January, we've seen year on year more boat crossings this year and uh, than last. So the, this is simply not working. And just finally, on, you, you've talked in your own policy about um, returns deals, about increasing the number of uh, immigration officers processing asylum claims, but also you've talked about needing more returns agreement. You've just talked about the Albania deal. What other deals are you planning to put into place? Are you in talks with any other countries? Well, there are a number of countries that are the sources of uh, people crossing uh, the channel on small boats. You're looking at countries like uh, India, Georgia, uh, other countries of that nature. We would be looking to do those deals to ensure that when you've uh, got somebody in the system whose asylum application has failed, they are removed mm. back to their home country. Mm. The number of removals on that basis has dropped massively since Labour was in government in 2010. So there's something gone very badly wrong with the returns and removal system, and that is what we want to fix with immigration enforcement officers, not just here, but also seconded to work with uh, governments and to negotiate those returns deals. Stephen Kinnock, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Kinnock there. Well, now back to Westminster and the Commons, where MPs are voting on the government's flagship Rwanda bill. The bill's expected to pass, albeit with the Lord's amendments knocked out, but the government faces a grumpy set of green benches.
Our never grumpy chief political correspondent, there he is, John Craig, is in central lobby, no place he'd rather be for us. John, hello there. Now, you've been watching the votes. What's the mood down in the Commons? Well, they haven't actually started voting yet, Beth. Uh, the debate is coming towards a close. Jim Shannon of the DUP is speaking at the moment. Then we'll get a wind-up from uh, uh, probably from Michael Tomlinson, the uh, illegal immigration minister who opened the debate, and they'll start voting at eight. Ten votes. Now, ten is the number of amendments that were passed by the House of Lords over the last few weeks, many of them with big majorities of over 100, ranging from challenging that uh, controversial claim in the bill uh, that Rwanda is a safe country, uh, giving the courts more powers, giving uh, asylum seekers and migrants more rights to challenge uh, the decisions of uh, the government in sending them back, um, and, uh, of course, exemptions for uh, unaccompanied children, for victims of uh, 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 trafficking, um, uh, modern slavery, and uh, crucially, those who've helped the UK armed forces in countries like Afghanistan. Now, going to be big, big government majorities. A mini rebellion on the Tory benches, though. Sir Robert Buckland, former uh, legal officer for the government, has talked in his speech a few moments ago about possibly rebelling on some of the amendments. Now, goes back to the Lords on Wednesday. Senior government ministers tell me they don't know what the Lords are going to do, but I can tell they have told me if the Lords send all ten back, then it won't get through the Commons before Easter. More delay. Thank you. There is our chief political correspondent, none other than John Craig. I actually could listen to him all day. Now, you're watching the Politics Hub coming up. A surprise visit, well, a surprise to the assembled hacks in Downing Street from a very special guest indeed. What did President Obama and Rishi Sunak discuss? That's next. These last few years have seen some huge stories. And these stories have been driven by politics, by politicians, the people in power. You must stay at home. And it's my job to figure out how these decisions made by politicians impact all of us in our everyday lives. This is the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. People turn up here with their child stuff in a black sack and just say, I don't want to. And that is what it is. It's, it's first class poverty. Is this an example of the welfare state failing? We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. These are stories that affect us all. Millions of children are now having to catch up. Some stories have changed all of our lives. Because like the residents, the staff are being infected. Politicians, they make decisions all of the time and it's our job to hold them to account. I wonder if you will take this opportunity to apologise to those families. But in the end, the real power doesn't actually lie with the politicians. The real power lies with the people. I'm Nick Martin. I'm the People and Politics Correspondent at Sky News. Now, Barack Obama made a surprise visit to Downing Street today, dropping in for a cuppa 
with Rishi Sunak. They chatted for about an hour, apparently about a range of subjects, including the PM's passion, AI, artificial intelligence. But not one to play favourites, he also met Keir Starmer. Now, all of this got some of the team here on the Politics Hub fangirl in, not me, of course, for the former president. So we thought we would bring you some other times he crossed the pond for a visit. And a warning, there are some flaccid images in the footage we're about to show. Barack Obama there. Now, our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is with me now. Um, he probably had a nicer conversation with Barack Obama than some of his own backbenchers, do you think? Oh, I think Rishi Sunak loves it when he can get away from the day-to-day -day of Westminster. Heard that earlier, he admitted as much. I mean, isn't it amazing, Beth? Barack Obama turns up at big moments in Britain's history. He, he first turned up in 2008 when he wasn't even president and he was still fighting the presidential race. And back then he met both Gordon Brown and the wannabe Prime Minister David Cameron and Gordon Brown's predecessor, Tony Blair. Back in 2012, when Barack Obama turned up, moments of his, I've just been looking at the photos, it was Barack Obama and, and Kate in Happier mm. Times and the Queen, 2016, where, you know, Barack Obama was being invited to take part in the Brexit referendum. There was the back of the queue quote. Well, Who can forget that? That fired badly as well. Didn't and a it? much more low key intervention mm. today. But mm. but this a moment of change and Barack Obama on the scene again. And do you think um, do you think that it helps Sunak appearing with Barack Obama? Moments like this are all about imagery, and there wasn't the photo of the two of them together on the steps of Downing Street. And there was a meeting with Keir Starmer. That equivalent, I think, doesn't necessarily help the incumbent. Well, I mean, you know, it could be that Keir Starmer becomes the next Prime Minister. He's certainly been um, uh, trying to make moves in America. They're very keen to try and get him to see President Biden. Let's uh, keep watching on that one. Um, Sam, thank you for reminding me of all the Obama moments. That was a nice way to end what has been quite a febrile uh, day again in Westminster. No sign of let up for the problems for the Prime Minister and we will have more of it all this week, not least with the Rwanda votes. Well, that's it from us tonight. I'll see you tomorrow at seven. Actually, I think Sophie's back. Uh, but up next, it's the UK Tonight with Sarah Jamie.